So if you listen to last week's episode um, when we talked about total bases per plate appearance, uh, what you heard was a brand new statistic being born. Right, we're giving birth to this, and so it's we, we got a lot of feedback, and it was great to receive oh, you know, yeah. stuff from you know, from from the people that listen, and asking us says, why don't we try to take it a little further? We were trying to create something really well, simple. That's I why we got well, started. It's not so, so much not taking asking us to take it further, but more pointing out that like, well, the one component to total bases that felt like it was being left out, it was it wasn't counting somebody's running contributions to this, and so. This current next version in bases created, I think, is not the furthest evolution. I think there's one more step we can take it, but I think this is good enough now because I'm not sure if we can track one more aspect to it. But bases created per plate appearance adds in what the runner is also doing on the base paths to a degree in addition to what he's doing with the bat. But it's more than that too, right? Because um, we talked about a player's entire offensive contribution is, and when you talk about total bases, it's singles, doubles, triples, and home runs. It doesn't include walks, doesn't include hit by pitch, doesn't include intentional walks, and those are all scenarios within the plate appearance where the player got a base. And it should be counted for that because the 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 off the pitcher's taking away a guy's chance to bat that really isn't his fault right he got on base if the purpose is getting on base without making an out and in these case that's the three things we're putting in now right and that's that's really the guiding principle of this is that we're looking at guys that the uh, the object of a plate appearance is to create a base and so that's why a sacrifice doesn't count towards it because you're giving up an out to create it. And we talked about that because there was a part like, well, you know, you are advancing a runner on the base. So in a sense, you're gaining a base when you sacrifice bunt, right? The but guy's it, going from first, but you're giving yourself it came up at the in the cost process. Of an out. And so by coming at the cost of an out, it's a net neutral in terms of bases created. Even sacrifice flies, which, by the way, were not counted early in Babe Ruth's time as uh, they were counted as an, an official at bat, whereas later on they became an RBI and not an at bat. We're not including those here either because the batter made an out. And for those of you that have heard about making outs and are probably already thinking about it, yes, grounded into double play does come into this and we'll be getting to that. Right, right. And and so we didn't include that well, we didn't include that either, although we did do we do it for the teams. But because it didn't come about that they kept it as a stat until sometime in the 1930s. Uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna discuss this more as we continue in there because I think there's a lot of interesting things that you notice with the grounded into double play stat. We also um, put in stolen bases minus caught stealing here, right? Because right? you gained the best. So this is why these are bases created. So it's not total bases are completely a batting stat. So this is going beyond that and looking at more of the offensive contribution beyond just hitting right because the guy that the guy that gets on base and then steals second is in effect creating two bases on his own and so that should be valued the same way a guy that hits a double gets valued but the same way that getting caught stealing ca counts against you the same way getting thrown out trying to stretch a single into a double should ping again penalize you so i mean that's kind of why it breaks down that way and we know all you fans are thinking the same thing that we are right so what about the time when a guy's on first and he goes from first to third right so he got an extra base if he on a base right. hit, he so should have gotten one base but he got the extra base or if he scores it comes all the way around he got two extra bases so this is what i was talking about when i'm saying there's sort of it's a another, rabbit hole folks another <laughs> another level we can take it to so in discussing that, I think one of the things we said is like a guy scoring from second on a single is the expected action virtually every single time. Right, he's not gaining an extra base. He's not gaining an extra base because the only way that happens is if it's on a ball that he shouldn't score on, but that would almost always be a defensive miscue in some sense. So that's an interpretation, right? Because you could be strict to this and now, say only counting, one base. But... We're not counting this in our statistics right, right. yet. It is something we've discussed because I do think that guys that are taking first to third or first to homes should be rewarded for being better base runners than other people. So except for Wilmer Flores, right? So if, if Wilmer were involved in the amount of times he gets thrown out trying to get an extra base or home play, he that would really ding would his really score hurt. a lot. So we don't. it's really hard to find that particular stat, right. like like how many times you got thrown out on the base. I'm sure I can go into stat head and, right. and, and, and come up with this. To, uh, it, so that's a potential evolution. <laughs> Still a work in progress here. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, where it is right now, base is created for paid appearance. Looking at it from a team perspective, you're sort of looking at how efficient overall is this offense 
at getting people on base. That does not necessarily mean it's the highest scoring offense, but rather you're looking at the team that's able to get the most men on base consistently. And I think you would probably equate that with an elite overall offense. And when you look at when you look at the bases created per plate appearance, it's not surprising the teams that are on top. Well, it was last week when we did it by total bases per plate appearance uh, on last Thursday's podcast, um, we had the Atlanta Braves as the number one hitting team of all time. So what happens if we go ahead and do it um, with, with bases created divided by plate appearances? The Atlanta Braves. <laughs> by about the same margin, too. <laughs> Basically, nothing changes. They're still the best. So to think about, you know, birthing a new stat here and having the first time that we come up with this, the team that's currently playing, having the all-time record for it, I think that's just strange and, and weird, and that's not the reason we started looking at this in the first place. No, but and it makes sense when you say this is the team that has the most, you might hit the most home runs all time. It has a ton of guys with a ton of 30 home runs, you've got a 40-70 guy. It makes sense that they're going to be the, the most prolific base-creating offense in the history of baseball. Interestingly, they're not the highest-scoring offense. Not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. I think it was the there was a Yankee team that averaged The 36 six, Yankees keeps coming up here. 6.9 runs a game on average, which you have to stop for a second and think about averaging almost seven runs every game, right? So anytime you get one or two runs, it means you're scoring 10, 11, or 12 sometimes to offset that. So that that's... And Ridiculous. more, actually. You're going to be throwing 13 or more to offset that difference. So I think it's kind of interesting that when you look at the bases created, that with double plays, I think, to me, is the, the sticking point for me because I want to count them so bad. But it dings basically one team. <laughs> when well, we look well at you know, so the 1927 Yankees, uh, we always talk about this team as the supposed uh, best hitting team of all time. You know, they, they are number 31 on the revised list when you look at it in terms of bases created per plate appearance. So they dropped down even further than they did on total bases per plate appearance. Right, but when you... When you add in double plays, they go shooting up because they don't lose a hundred something bases from hitting into double plays across a season. They're not the team that catches by that measure that catches the Braves, but you know what? The 1936 Yankees exceed the Braves because they don't have grounded into double plays dinging their total. Right. So it's it, so it's like it's interesting. I think a potential evolution of this will be eventually be adding in both the double grounded into double plays and taking the extra and base with an base asterisk base. now <laughs> with then removing the three Yankees teams right from the list and sort of acknowledging that they are the greatest offenses prior to the DH the grounded double into double play territory because the only other team that kind of exists to that is like the 59 Dodgers. The, 53, the 53, 53 Brooklyn Dodgers. Dodgers. You're right. 53, which, who lost in the World Series to the Yankees. But And it's funny, I, I don't know. I didn't think of them as a hitting team that way because historically it's not a team. You know, you knew they had a lot of good players. They had a lot of World Series teams that didn't win until 55 finally. finally. But they, you know, are, are in the top 10 all time based upon bases uh, created by, by plate appearance. So that impressed me. Like, they're the only team aside from those teams you mentioned. The right. 36 Yankees um, being the other team in the top 10. And I think that's what's interesting looking about this list is pretty much then all you're seeing are teams from the mid-90s onwards. Which is what we said last week right. happened with total bases per plate appearance. Which makes sense. Home runs are up. DH is up. You do not have soft hitting. You basically no longer have two non-competing hitters in the lineup. You're down to zero. So here, here's what I, I think would come out argument-wise. So the DH started in 1973. So we don't see immediately teams from 74, 5, and 6, early in the DH history. And the NL didn't put the DH in just a couple of years ago, yet you've got a lot of AL teams, as we talked about, in 96 and 97. And so you think about the teams that I see appearing once they went to the expanded playoff format. All of a sudden, the team's total bases per plate appearance and bases created per plate appearance, you know, went up decidedly. And is, does that have anything to do? It's not with expansion, um, but, but with the way that, you know, why would that happen, right? Was it ball being juiced from 96 on? Was that the, into the steroid era? Um, there's a lot of factors that make me wonder why it didn't, there's none of them in the 80s, right? There's, right. Why think, isn't there any? I think there's a few reasons for that. I think one team's steroids definitely had something to do with it. It's teams valued offense a lot more and teams were more willing to have guys that were not good defenders play the field as long as they were good enough hitters. Then you had the discovery of three true outcomes and having guys in the lineup that might hit 200, 
but will hit 40 home runs became a total norm, totally normal thing and not sort of only a bastion of last place teams looking to have some kind of bright spot on their team. Well, well how about this? And, and so it really kind of lays out since 1996. So 1995 was the strike year ends, mm-hmm. right? And all of a sudden baseball is in trouble and we get the home run race in 98 between you know, McGuire and Sosa and so on and so forth. All of the top 30 years, except for the three that we mentioned, the 30 Yankees, the 27 Yankees, and the 36 Yankees happened since 1996. Which- so... Ball juice, steroids, smaller parks, um, chicks dig the long ball. I mean, all that stuff. <laughs> Emphasis on three true outcomes. <laughs> Which really didn't happen, I think, until a little bit later. That, right? Three true outcomes 20, wasn't... But that's that's right. why you have so many 90s teams when you have the steroids, and then now 2010 teams onwards, where you have teams that are emphasizing hit the ball as far as you can every single time. And I'll, I'll, we'll post this uh, chart on yeah. the website on, on, on the episode notes. Uh, I don't think we did that last week when we said we were going to. But it, I'm not going to go through the teams because it, they're basically the same teams we talked about last week in that, in that period since 1996. It reshuffles a little bit based upon using bases created. Right, uh, but it's not anything major. And it probably would favor, and I, I haven't done the even this th- thought through yet, are the faster teams benefiting and going up the bases created of the power hitting teams? Right. That's because your, you're now you're factoring in stolen bases right. and all and that. It, it, that's going to be a big part of it because that's going to be the biggest gain for those teams is specifically in that and teams that walked a lot. So, um, you know, again, just to, to review, right, you've got now uh, the top team of all time, the Braves. We've got them at .566, if you will, bases created per place appearance, uh, plate appearance. So that basically, uh, let's just try to make it in six plate appearances, they'd have uh, three bases, basically. Easier way to think about it. For every two guys they send to the plate, one, one of them gets to first base. Right. And if you think about an offense, an offense that does that in baseball, well, it gets a base. I don't even say, it gets the first base. It's not it first a, base. It's, it's a, a base. It's a base, right? But still, so, it's a, the equivalent of getting to first. So you know, and and so the teams that obviously have more base runners and all would score more runs. Although it doesn't mean, as we said, that you're going to have the highest scoring team of all time no. in terms of runs per game, uh, which I find interesting because you would think more traffic would would deliver that. But so it's, I think it's interesting to also then you know maybe take a look at the players and the individual. You know, and what what people would have done for their career, right? And and so uh, the, the 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 expected suspect is on top, though. I guess it depends on your age as to who you think that is. I well, well, Babe Ruth was the guy that came out last week as the, uh, the most efficient player of all time, and he remains there by six ten thousandths of a of a point over Barry Bonds, just barely retaining his crowd so uh again this this incorporates total bases total base uh, stolen bases minus caught stealing intentional walks walks and hit by pitch so those stats yep. um and so because bonds walked a lot he came up the list here a little considerably bit considerably uh, per plate really appearance narrowed right. it down which right kind of shows you how much that, that helps somebody like bonds so it's like it should he shouldn't have been punished for essentially that they stopped pitching to him at a certain point right i think he's still the most recent player to be walked with the bases loaded there's mm-hmm. been a, there's been a, a handful of them over the, the history of major league baseball but it has happened you know before what's What's interesting to me also about this list is if you take Babe Ruth and Barry Bonds' number, and, and we've talked about them, we've done podcasts about comparing the two How of them. It's great that they're right here. We right. should have done that. We should have done that when we did the podcast about those oh, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but the number three guy in the list is probably, and we talked about it a little bit last week, but that in this list, when you resort and all that stuff, Vlad Guerrero Sr. Um, is number three, and he's comfortably number three above Mike Trout. Which is very interesting. Right, which is interesting that you've got two modern guys there, but you would both, when you think about it, it makes sense for them because they're both prolific power hitting outfielders that steal bases. In Trout's case, right, because he strikes out a lot, so you think that would hurt him a little bit, but, uh, and I don't think he's a huge walk guy. Right, but his, the fact that he steals 30 ish bases as a, a power season, hitter, as a power hitter, gives him an angle to help rise up that list that most other power hitters just simply don't have. I, I was looking at Babe Ruth's, you know, I don't know what, because, you know, I, I, mean, I always talk about how he got thrown out to end the 1926 mm-hmm. World Series at second base trying to steal, um, but he has a net seven plus seven for career stolen bases. I think he stole 123 and got caught 116. 
times. Right. Mike, Mike <laughs> Trout, you know, is stealing thirty plus bases right. a year. He clears that in a year. So that that hurts, you know, Ruth's obviously right, exactly and his quotient there. Guys like Bonds and Trout and Guerrero to catch up to him. And now Lou Gehrig is fifth on the list, which is interesting because he's not a guy who stole any bases to my no, to my knowledge. Just, you know, one of the all time hitters. Right. Right. Um. And and how about the next guy, Larry Walker? I, I'm surprised he, that he shows up so well on this list. This is an all-time list that has Larry Walker number six. Right. And so, and so what we're looking at is that this is not necessarily a guy that was, you know, bases created. What does that mean on an individual level? Because with the teams, we were talking about how it kind of helps represent the most efficient offense. But bases created, would you say it's the most efficient offensive player, the most productive? I... I... Yes. <laughs> My answer would be yes. The most efficient, efficient and, and productive. most productive, right? Because you are doing, you are advancing the team's mission base by base, right? Better than anybody else. So that's why I would say it, it kind of is both. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and after Gehrig is Joe DiMaggio, I, 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 ahead of Larry Walker, so that my, my mistake, and, and I shouldn't shouldn't have put down the Yankee Clipper. But after that is Hank Greenberg, one of the great players of all time, Hall of Fame player. Um, Here's a guy who's going to tick everybody because he. This is the first non-hall of well, no, except for Barry Bonds. He's not a Hall of Famer. Should be. Um, should be. That this guy is uh, on the list. He is number nine all time uh, for bases created per plate appearance. Juan Gonzalez. Wow. So people are like Juan Gonzalez. What? Yeah. How does he get on an all-time list of anything? Well, he won two MVPs by right. the way, you back can to back. See how a guy like him would be very efficient on that. He walked a ton. He hit for a good average. He hit a lot of for power. He's going to show up on for this. And he probably had more stolen bases than you'd think. Well, not only that, but I think he's going to want to come on the podcast now, right? And I don't, I don't, I think, I don't know that he speaks a lot of English. Maybe he does. I hope he does. Uh, because he, here's a list where Juan Gonzalez is ahead of Ted Williams. Right, so if you're in an all-time list for baseball and you are one spot at Ted Williams, you want to talk about that. Yeah, you you are better. You are more efficient. We're, right now, this base is created for plate appearances, saying that he is a more efficient <laughs> and productive offensive player than Ted Williams. And no one is going to believe no. that, that that Juan Gonzalez was a better ball player than Ted Williams. So. But he might have been. But but as an as an efficient for his career, and that way, and by measuring this, and you know, Ted Williams was a station to station guy. I don't I don't know how many stolen bases he had in his career. I don't think it was very many. So he but, didn't have to. Would it hurt him if we added it and grounded it into double plays? Uh, well, they both would be subject to it because right. they were counting. But that's what I'm saying. You know, would he be hurt by that? I think Juan Gonzalez would have a fair share of getting, you know, yeah. getting getting hit by that as well. Um, behind Ted Williams is the great Jimmy Fox. Hmm. Um, uh, another non-Hall of Famer follows him, Manny Ramirez, who's ahead of Hank Aaron. So Manny's going to want to come on the podcast and say, wait a second, I want to talk about me being ahead of Hank Aaron in something. Right, but it kind of shows... <laughs> This, this kind of stat kind of shows one of the common knocks against Aaron is that towards the end of the career, he became a bit of a compiler where he just played a crazy number of seasons and he was not putting up. Oh, he was putting up good offensive statistics at the end, but not anywhere close to what he was when he was an elite player. Uh, well, and, and, and the same thing happened with the guy who's behind him on the list. Willie Mays. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here we got Manny Ramirez like, yeah, Check it out. I'm ahead of Hank Aaron and Willie Mays on this list. It's a pretty good, yeah, pretty good claim exactly. to make. Uh, just, just to round out some of the other names, Albert Bell, so another non-Hall of Famer, who we think his Hall of Fame case is a lot stronger than people give him just because he was a, a surly guy and not a great defender. It the is dude interesting was a that all these guys that are higher up on there, I would describe all of them as guys that were better base dealers than people would realize. Yes, well, not Albert Bell. No, not Albert. <laughs> Man, Man, I bet Manny, Manny was a somewhat, at least early in his career, because he would get 15, 20 steals yeah. a year. Yeah. And so that's going to help him. I was thinking looking for a bottle of water at second base or something like right. that. I'm not sure why he was running down there. So he- It got bad towards the end <laughs> when he stopped, when he, his legs stiffened up. But early in his career, he would steal some bases every season. And and so it, it's just interesting. To, I, I like Johnny Mize's name comes up here, and so you've heard of Johnny Mize. He's a Hall of Fame ball player, but you know played a long time ago. So you're not immediately familiar. So wouldn't have necessarily expected because again you don't think of Johnny Mize as a speed guy. I don't no. believe he was a, a so, but a power hitter, and he's one slot ahead of Ryan Braun. Wow, on an all time list, Ryan Braun ahead of A Rod. 
<laughs> A-Rod's going to want to come on the pod and say, what is going on here? This list is terrible. There's right. no list that Ryan Braun is ahead of me. End of story. So, <laughs> I think it's interesting when you're looking at this just because it's an, a different way of sort of evaluating a player and sort of giving a contribution for their ability to get on base as much as hit for power and steal bases. Right, and we're not even giving the taking extra bases, you know, aspect of I think, this. I, I would really like to see what this comes down to if we add in taking the extra bases and ground it into double plays, who sort of comes out on top then. Because you have, because I think that was something that you would look at that it was interesting that you were looking at the uh, if you were looking at this season, Freddie Freeman had almost the same uh, base running war that Acuna has. Right, right, and and he stole twenty bases to boot. Right, but uh, Acuna stole 70. seventy. <laughs> right, so it's, it's just interesting to show you how base running can be valued and how it can be valued differently. So I think that's something adding in taking the extra base. I think would really help this. And it's and there's a subjective nature to it a little bit because we like to talk about one of our favorite players, Keith Hernandez. And, and although you didn't get to see him play, um, Keith was not the fastest guy on the field, but was an excellent base runner. And so somebody that can be an excellent base runner without having great speed, like Freddie Freeman, right? He's not a right. blazing because, fast guy. Because that's something that normally that really doesn't show up in the stat sheet. But should be, because a guy that's able to consistently find a way to take the extra base, go first to third, go first to home. It does something for his offense that a guy that can't do that doesn't, you know, obviously. And, and and I think that that's something that's important. You know, you have these guys that are able to score and put their and put their team ahead by doing something that doesn't show up in the stat box. Yeah. And, and I think so we're going to have to sort of dig in and try to come up and see, does that impact? Oh, I know. It, I know it exists. And, and we did it when we looked at grounding into double plays. It, it did shift stuff around, but it, we're it, not we, ready to. We're to, not ready to do it yet, mostly because we just need to figure out whether we need to have the Yankee clause where it's like, well, you have the three Yankee teams that throw it off. But the, the thing is, it's only them. They're the only teams from that era that even come close yeah, to showing no, no one's going to go back in that era and never catch anybody in this, the way things are today. Right, and, and none of the – there's. it's not like there's like a, a 1930 Philly team that's also there that we're just not talking about. No, it's these three teams from that era and then no no other team. That's an interesting point you make because I think I could go and find 1930 teams that would be in the top 50 or 100 all time, just right. not at the very top of the list like we're talking and about. So that's why we're saying it might make more sense in the long run just to exclude teams from before, before grounded into double plays just because – Okay, the Yankees were the unbelievable offense of that era. They were the best. Nobody was close. It's not even close. Right. And when they scored 6.9 runs per game, I had to feel that they, 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 the rest of the pitching wasn't up to par, and the Yankees just slaughtered everybody. Right. You know, they were just that much better than everybody. I, I do want to talk about some of the other names on it because there are names that pop up here uh, in an all time list. So when I'm, I'm down to, well, I'm down to number 20 or number 19. Mm -hmm. That's Albert Pujols. That makes sense. Stan Musial's number 20, so Cardinal over Cardinal. Sammy Sosa after Stan Musial. I just don't expect well, to see him he here. Stole, I think he did steal bases. He stole 30, I think, one year. Stealing bases, I think, is undervalued because it's gonna there's go, there's going to be a lot of guys on this list that don't have, like, any. Oh, yeah? And then how about the next guy on the list, Mike Piazza? Right, no, but that's what I'm he saying. He didn't steal any bases. But that's but, but that's why guys are above him is because they stole oh, bases. Oh, so he would have been he would have been higher up were it not for the fact that he's not getting he helped by that. Right, exactly. Al Simmons, then, then how could you how could you explain that Mike Piazza is ahead of Al Simmons? Forget that. Ken Griffey Jr. is two slots below Piazza. Talk about a guy that stole bases. Right, right, but he did not have nearly the length of an offensive career that Piazza did at an elite level because C Griffey went over to the Reds and, like, 2000 ish and basically immediately fell apart so so it just it gets it gets you to think about guys that maybe we don't think about hall of fame ways that in this particular idiom end up looking very well so right. and it's interesting is a lot of the 90s player that when you had all these elite 90s power hitters that could also steal bases that's who you see shooting up on a list like this and because this is valuing sort of the complete offensive package at number five is mark mcguire uh, at number uh, in number twenty twenty five, I should say number twenty six is Alfonso Soriano on an all time again list ahead of Frank Robinson. Right. What? 
What? Because he probably stole so many. Because he stole that. He was with the first forty forty guy. I think one of the first. One, not the, I think one of the I can't first. Can't say yeah. was um, uh, forty forty guy. Um, so Frank Robinson, Carlos Delgado checks in on this list. Uh, Chuck Klein of the thirty uh, of the nineteen thirty Phillies. Good, good, good on you for remembering that. Willie Stargell. David Ortiz checks in at number 31. So it's interesting. Arenado is right behind him. So it, and Dick Allen is at number 33, who's a guy that we think should be in the Hall of Fame, too. So there are a lot of guys that, like, you know, this would really, I think, assist their case if you used it as an arguing point for guys that might have been overlooked. Right. That, that come into this that you would have not expected. And say that, you know, this, this, this kind of dings all of your career compilers. Guys that just got to like a 400 or 500 home run total. Because if you're somebody that got there while hitting 230, you're not going to just show up super amazing on this. But list. compilers is so pejorative. I mean, I feel I right, mean, but that but <laughs> we're digging because we, we when you say Dave Kingman. Oh, yeah, he won't be on any list like this. Right, exactly. <laughs> that's 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 what I think this is. Andres has. Galarraga, however, checks in at 37. You think about 400 home runs. Did you know that Galarraga had 399 career home runs? Oh, yeah, because Galarraga was an elite offensive player. He Playing was in an in, elite, a, a ballpark, a, too. Whatever the opposite of elite defensive player. <laughs> I mean, he was an elite defensive player for the other team. And Bagwell's right behind him, and if I had to think of their careers, right, there's no way you think Galarraga had the equal career to Bagwell or even close. Well, I think that you would describe them at their peaks to be somewhat similar. And Galarraga, I felt like, stopped playing a lot quicker than Bagwell did. No, he played He played a bunch of years, though. He played 19 years. And wow, really? Years. So, yeah. I don't think he maybe didn't play all that much near the end of his career. Uh, but, yeah, he, he played a lot of years. And Bagwell's behind him, Dawson behind him, and J.D. Martinez checks in at number 40. Mart so there's a guy that Martinez you don't is about. a guy that might get some Hall of Fame talk wow. when he Wow, I don't know. He, he is, he, there's no number in J.D. Martinez. Martinez's but when you look at his resume. career numbers, they're going to be better than anybody thinks. And talk about a guy that took you know his career from where it was to uh, another level when it wasn't expected after he left the Tigers, right? Mm -hmm. And went, boy, I, I gotta I gotta give him a lot of credit. And Giancarlo Stanton, by the way, is right behind JD Martinez, and he's a guy who could compile his way. Oh yeah, um, and he's ahead of Moises Alou. So I, I we'll, we'll post the lists. I think you know uh, yeah, and, they're fun to talk and I about. I think we're going to continue to refine it because I think there's just a little bit more tweaking to add in some of those base running statistics and if you and if anybody out there has any ideas you know on both what the current keep way writing to us it. and so we, we make some changes on the basis of what people ask yeah, us yeah about. all the people bringing up all the different base running aspects to it really was what kind of encouraged us to go back and take a look at it and see how we could refine it so We've come this far thanks to everybody out there. So, you know, any more feedback is always appreciated. I guess the next thing we can kind of do is to see, is there any link to this and a team success, you know, uh, on a percentage basis? Obviously, it doesn't mean you're going to win, but are the teams that are efficient in this stat more uh, able to win World Series or and, get to right. them? And, and I guess if you just want to look at it, and if you're a Brave fan, you can look at this and go tell your friends all this, that right now – the Atlanta Braves offensive lineup is basically a lineup of Babe Ruth because they have the same bases created per paid appearance as the Babe Ruth. The greatest offensive team in Major League history.